So I'm sorry. Well, good, and thank uh, you for your patience. Oh uh, no, no, thank you. And um, we are a little bit nervous because uh, really, it's a really an honor for us. Uh, oh no, please, really. please. Okay, so I think we are live now. Let me just not know yet. Sorry. Just a few minutes. So sorry, I'm just having some issues with the live. I'm gonna, I'm trying to do it again. If not, we can just uh, um, record from here and then we yeah. uh, broadcast it for later. It's just pre preparing the live. Live, live, live. Okay, so let's start then. Um, welcome everyone to our first episode of Confabulating, which is the second stage of uh, our project. We will count with some international uh, specialists as well. Uh, and we have the honor to welcome Professor Friedman uh, to, to our project. And thank you so much, Professor Friedman. It's an honor. And thank you for you to embark in this adventure with us. And thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you, Joao. Uh, it's a great pleasure. And um, I look forward to our discussion. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Professor Friedman. Uh, just to introduce Professor Pr uh, Friedman, Paul Friedman um, is a Chester D D D Trip Professor of History at Yale University. He is specialized in medieval social history, the history of Spain, the study of medieval peasantry, and medieval cuisine. Professor Friedman has a BA at University of California at Santa Cruz and a MLS from the School of Library and Information Studies at University of California at Berkeley. He received a PhD in history at Berkeley and taught for 18 years at Vanderbilt University before joining Yale. His book, Images of the Medieval Peasants, won the Medieval Academy's prestigious Haskins Medal. So once again, welcome Professor Friedman. And before we start our interview, we will release our intro. to uh, History 210, the early Middle Ages. Uh, I'm Paul Friedman, and- me for that <laughs> beautiful piece of work. Um, Professor Friedman, probably we can start with this sentence. It was the end, or there was some continuity? Uh, well, it was, certainly was the end of something. Uh, and as I said in that, at some point in that, uh, video of my early Middle Ages class uh, that I was a moderate catastrophist. 
So there are people who are um, catastrophists and who uh, say uh, the end of the Roman Empire in the West or the barbarian invasions or whatever you want to call them. Uh, Chris Wickham refers to it as radical simplification of everyday life, uh, that this really was uh, a catastrophe. And they, um, the, the continuous point to the, not only the survival of the Eastern Empire, but the survival of many uh, institutions uh, and ways of life and um, economic activity as well. So uh, I think it is not the end in the sense of apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic novels or science fiction that was, uh, I, I used to read a lot of in my youth and that of course remains popular. That is the kind of thing where civilization comes to an end, you know, you know uh, writing, reading, culture, um, even the memory of civilization is preserved only in ruins. Uh, Planet of the Apes, a movie of the 1960s is perhaps emblematic of that. So there's no question that that's not the case. The, um, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I would say there's plenty of, uh, plenty of change, plenty of. Can we say that it's uh, at the end of uh, um... A, a symbol or at the end of uh, um, something that, uh, I mean, uh, it was a symbol, right? It was um, uh, the name, the, the Roman Empire was um, a symbol of, of strength of, um, uh, can we say that it was just a, um, a little bit the, the end of, of that sign, that symbol and uh, just something was a change. In fact, it wasn't the end, but it was some, uh, some point it was a change. Right, or you could say that the symbol is preserved, but not in its old form. In other words, yeah. to some extent, uh, the papacy would become the heir to many Roman institutions from the title Pontifex Maximus to the fact that it remained headquartered in Rome uh, and the church generally in the use of Latin, for example, or the clothes of priests uh, preserved late Roman habits of mind. The, uh, your question though, gets at an aspect that is really covered neither by the traditional catastrophist or traditional continuist point of view, it seems to me. And that is who is hurt and who benefits. Yes. So to be an average uh, agriculturalist, uh, peasant, uh, person tied to the land, uh, the uh, barbarian era is not necessarily so much worse in terms of trade, as Michael McCormick's work has shown. There is less overall, but that's partly uh, because the state is not imposing this huge burden on uh, an essentially colonial world. For example, the tributes of wheat paid by North Africa and Sicily to Rome. Uh, these come to an end and it certainly means that Rome has to empty out. You can't have um, close to a million people in Rome as you had in the uh, time of Augustus. Uh, but um, for the average person being freed from the very well organized and essentially oppressive government or lordship of private parties, uh, you know, far be it from me, I don't like to move people around the chessboard. I think historians tend to do that a little too much, but it's not a catastrophe for everybody, even if you take the radical simplification of life approach. It is a catastrophe for civilization though. You mean in terms of um, uh, literacy, or? ability of a substantial number of people to um, uh, work with their minds, no. circulation of texts, yes. uh, recollection of Greek in the West. I actually think those are important things yes. and they are important measures. Yeah. That, that is a, um, a point that uh, I have um, um, 
a question about it because um, it, it, it's 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 is it a coincidence uh, the the rise of the Christ Christianity and uh, this um, this uh, uh, we enter the mid mid uh, Middle Ages uh, with the rise of the Christianity right it, it, it's a, a little bit it's they they it's a coincidence or it's uh, the rise of Christianity comes and brings that so-called darkness um, and uh, because the, the Greek uh, the, the focusing in, in, in what she just said that, that uh, literacy, um, all these Greek elements, these symbols, they are um, just the, the, the Christianity hides it, right? So it starts, um, there's a change. Uh, the Roman Empire, it, it collapsed. But at the same time, uh, we have um, these dark ages that co are a little bit coincidence with uh, with uh, with the, the, the Christianity. So, is it all um, linked? Is this is there a link between this? Uh, I would say that Christianity, rather than hiding it, um, uh, absorbs it. Um, the preservation of texts, including, of course, pagan ones, is due to Christian copyists uh, who preserve literacy so that you have very little lay literacy of the type that had been common in the Roman Republic and indeed the Roman Empire and the entire classical world. So the to the degree that what we think of as civilization, we being uh, you know people of an academic turn of mind, I would say that the sort of idea associated with Edward Gibbon that Christianity was the cause of the collapse of the Roman Empire is not generally accepted, and I don't accept it either. Yeah. That Christianity saved the Roman Empire, yes, in the sort of city of God sense. It, um, it, it tried to preserve it and it preserved some of its institutions. And uh, you don't, as I said before, have a kind of complete uh, elimination of historical memory or historical culture. Yeah. In so I can understand some uh, uh, of the questions in, in Portuguese. And I was <laughs> going to say that with great confidence, but I can see uh, uh, Rosaria's question, do you think a catastrophe, an, uh, an era that could be, but I don't know what dark trevish means. It's like darkness. The, the darkness. dark ages. Uh, dark ages, ah, yes, yes. yes. Well, um, dark ages, you know, uh, this was a term that I was taught not to use uh, because uh, it was too much of a Renaissance uh, uh, and Gothic as well, uh, a Renaissance condemnation of the Middle Ages. The um, way that historians, at least in the Anglo-American world, use the term, it's sometimes in quotes, or it's sometimes, for your convenience, we'll call it the Dark Ages, but it isn't really. Uh, the way that the word feudalism is sometimes uh, 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 used. But... Um, uh, that's why I make fun of in the videos a little bit, Chris Wickham's <laughs> radical simplification of culture, but uh, of, of everyday life. That means things like you no longer are importing the fine kinds of amphora from North Africa. We can date the end of that trade. We can date the end of all sorts of uh, aspects of gracious living in the Roman Empire from indoor plumbing to spices. Um, that's a radical simplification. And if I was a well-off person in the Roman Empire, I'd certainly miss it. The, the gastronomy has to decline, yeah. among other things. But, um, uh, you know, that's uh, my, my immediate point of comparison is rationing during the Second World War in Britain. Well, if you read most people's uh, uh, from the articulate or a well, reasonably well-off classes, it was a terrible thing. It was a, a great ordeal. Uh, but in fact, the average nutrition in Britain was better in, in the depths of the war in 1942, 1943, than it had been in 1938, 1939, uh, because um, the government was giving poor people 
powdered milk and powdered eggs. And, uh, you know, they had been much closer to starvation before. And Professor Friedman, before we, we continue, can we just go back a little bit on time and just can you let us know or, or, or try to explain what happened uh, with Rome uh, or with the Roman Empire at this point that become a breaking point? So that leads to these breaking points or the so-called fall of the Roman yeah. Empire. Yeah. Well, some of it, uh, it depends how far you want to go back. And one of the problems with going back too far is that, you know, everything depends on some event that took place a long time ago, like the Black Death has been used this way. Um, I think that what is clear is the failure of the army to protect the frontier. And if you start investigating that, I mean, um, uh, Roger Collins entitled a chapter of his introductory book on the early Middle Ages, The Disappearance of an Army. Here with Diocletian in particular, the Diocletianic reform around 300 sets up this gigantic army to uh, patrol the Persian as well as the Danube Rhine barbarian frontier. It doubles the size of the army. It creates this structure of taxation to finance it. And yet there are very few pitched battles in which, you know, okay, Adrianople, uh, but th there are very few pitched battles in which the barbarians defeat the Roman army. The barbarians, um, first of all, they're not all that barbarian. They're sort of Romanized. Many of them are brought in as, um, as mercenaries. Uh, many of them sort of latch on to Roman areas and the hospitality system. Uh, but, the, but the army with all its power and uh, significance isn't there. I uh, would compare this in a way, and uh, this is the sort of idea of suicide, um, uh, 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 of the Roman Empire. Yeah, you can say suicide in the sense that they expended a huge amount of energy in areas that proved to be useless. The, the fall of the Soviet Union has some uh, parallels, a gigantic military uh, establishment that arguably bankrupted the civil economy and, and that was never used. There was never an invasion of uh, the Soviet Union after the Second World War. Whatever okay. happened in the end of the 1980s was not a military defeat. So um, uh, I, I wouldn't say suicide uh, in, in the video because that assumes a deliberate decision. Um, a stupid accident, you know, like driving while drunk um, or, uh, I mean, uh, I don't have to tell you that the United States is full of um, quasi-suicidal aspects uh, to its high politics. But um, uh, yeah, I just rejected the, the notion because it, 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 I don't think the Roman Empire deliberately, deliberately set out, you know, like mm -hmm. to swallow a bunch of pills and write a farewell note. Yes, can we call it uh, an implosion? Uh, yes, yes, I think that's possible. And, and the long-term causes... Uh, what I had been taught was um, agricultural problems, uh, a you know long-term lack of agricultural uh, productivity, um, dependence on a kind of unsustainable infrastructure, namely these huge taxation and uh, transfers of money in order to feed these urban centers, a top-heavy urban rather than rural uh, society. Uh, one in which the imbalance between East and West became greater and greater. Um, size, although for hundreds of years that hadn't been a problem, uh, but uh, there's a way in which problems uh, uh, suddenly are no longer long term. Um, uh, very popular at one time was the notion of a decline of civic virtue or loyalty the inability of the Roman Empire to get its wealthy citizens to support the state or even their locality. Some of this is due to the Diocletianic system, which seems to have oppressed and bankrupted 
the so-called Coriolis, the urban elite. Uh, some of it has to do with the senators and the very wealthy basically abandoning uh, the cities and setting themselves up in their villas as kind of fiefs before the Middle Ages. There was as well a, a, prob a problem with loyalty as well, because for them, it should be everything because the, the, the empire was quite uh, big. And if they could not trust in the people that they have put in charge, that will be a problem. And there are some episodes of that, right, Professor Friedman? Yes, well, of course, the people that they put in charge were often not Roman. Uh, on the other hand, as with now, the definition of who's a foreigner and who is, you know, a virtuous native are, are kind of foolish because the Romans themselves uh, not only dealt with the barbarians, uh, made arrangements with them, uh, but um, the, the, the distinction was not always uh, very meaningful. Uh, There's a lot of uh, marriage, intermarriage, and alliances. So uh, there's a notion of civic virtue, that is the willingness of distinguished or wealthy citizens to sacrifice, for example, to serve in the military. And uh, at my university, for example, uh, people have said that you can see the decline of American civic virtue in uh, the uh, building that it serves as a kind of a student center in which are inscribed the names of all the Yale uh, men because it was an all male university at the undergraduate level until 1969. All the men who died in American military campaigns. So this building was built as a memorial to the First World War. And so they very carefully inscribed the names of, <clears throat> I don't know, 150 or so people who had graduated from Yale and who died in the First World War. And then in the Second World War, there are you know, about 250 or 300. Uh, in the Korean War, there may be 70, 60. <clears throat> in the Vietnam War, there are only five or six. And in subsequent conflicts, uh, you had to have extraordinarily bad luck to have graduated from Yale and to have died in military service. Um, that's because the elite who used to go to Yale um, were willing to uh, serve in the military. And uh, starting around at the time I was in college, uh, that was no longer true. Uh, and, and there wasn't a universal draft. In other words, there wasn't conscription or uh, required military service for men. Uh, and it was uh, not difficult for people of um, uh, means to evade it. So it can we call it a, a lack of um, a strength of the, the, the structure, the elite, as you call it, um, uh, it's the, the the ones who have the power, the wealth uh, to to uh, to have and, and maintain those those armies. They started to to be loyal to themselves uh, instead of, of of Rome. I mean, uh, they 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 started to 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 have their own uh, because they 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 grew up right as uh, as uh, as senators as the elite. The, itself um, so they started to be loyal to themselves instead of the of the the roman empire the the, the, the center the, the emperor can we call it like this a little bit of lack of um of um i don't know i don't know how to say it but uh, like Juan said no no loyalty no loyalty to the the emperor but to they start to look only for themselves let's yes say. yes yes well i that would assume that at some point, the elite had been really self-sacrificing. And I don't think I would say that. In other words, the, the elite in all societies is composed of people who act for themselves. Uh, you don't get to that status or maintain it by a kind of um, Mother Teresa selflessness. But the elites are often held together by pride and honor. And pride and honor often involves bravery or courage, military service, uh, and uh, just as it also may involve um, putting on civic spectacles, uh, gladiatorial 
uh, 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 things or sacrifices to the gods. The fact that you spend money uh, is in order to aid your sense of status, virtue, honor, and uh, it can benefit the community. Uh, my university, for example, uh, does not is not financed by the uh, tuition that students pay, but rather by uh, the um, donations of people who most of whom have graduated from the university. So uh, that um, is a form of self-sacrifice, but it has some uh, tax advantages. Uh, it also uh, is for the vanity of the donors. So the building that I mentioned with all the names, its name is going to be changed because someone gave $100 million in order to uh, fix yes. it up. Yes. Um, and he's a terrible person, by the way. I mean, I can't, I can't believe um, having to refer to the building uh, by, by, by this guy's name, but nevertheless, uh, um, I suppose it's better than his spending the money on uh, another yacht or something like that. So we can call it a, 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 a two-side... Um, right, yes. right, right. So the Roman elite um, was willing to serve in positions of authority, uh, including military, uh, even if they weren't making money off it. They were making something else that was important to them, which was honor, and often they already had an awful lot of money. But uh, when that sense of oligarchic cohesion or an ethos of service fades, then you can have these consequences of the elite becoming much more uh, interested in grabbing everything they possibly can at the expense of the state. Yeah. And in opposition of this uh, fall of the empire, uh, so-called, um, the sense of continu continuity, how did the, the empire continue, let's say? Well, I think uh, people like my colleague, uh, Walter Goffert, have um, uh, made strong arguments for continuity based on uh, the barbarians just sort of come in and they all they want to do is be as Roman as possible. Uh, they, they adopt Roman uh, ways of life. They, yes, they're Aryan Christians for a while, but eventually all of them either are conquered like the Vandals or convert like the Visigoths. Uh, they protect the church. Lots of monasteries are created in you know, the Merovingian Empire. The Visigothic king uh, is the, uh, allows the, what is it, 12 councils of uh, Toledo to take place. The uh, conversion of the English rulers uh, is followed up very quickly by the collection of huge numbers of books and arguably the Northumberland of Bede and his circle was the most learned uh, place in Europe in uh, for much of the eighth century. So um, uh, the the Latin language continues. It becomes uh, changed in various countries into different vernaculars, but the uh, fall is too dramatic a word according to the uh, continuists. And it has a Renaissance feel again, a periodization. Uh, the pictures that you showed in the little presentation. One is a series, right, of the stages of an empire. Uh, and it's dawn, noon, afternoon, and night. And I think you showed the one of the kind of flourishing of the, it's that harbor scene with the, the white columns uh, going into the water. I forget where that is. It's in some American museum. Um, uh, but, you know, that's, that's the received idea. Uh, and so the fall is preceded by a period of decadence uh, where 
Yeah. 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 What ahead. happened? What happened in the West that didn't happen in the the East because the East uh, continued until the Ottomans and the the West just uh, so what what was different between the East and the and the West? Uh, uh, the survival of cities. Yes. And when the cities collapsed, with the exception of Constantinople in the East, the East had its own Dark Ages. So it's become increasingly clear that there isn't a direct survival prosperity of the Byzantine Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire. Its own Dark Ages start with the, um, the Persian Wars, Heraclius, uh, beginning of the seventh century, dramatically increased by the Islamic conquests in the mid and late seventh century. And so the eighth, and then uh, exacerbated by iconoclasm. So you see some of the same eclipse of cities in the Byzantine Empire, places like Sardis or Ephesus uh, or um, Smyrna uh, or Pergamum. So Pergamum and, and Ephesus basically cease to exist. They're very impressive ruins, but yeah. they are, uh, they're not medieval cities. Uh, and the others that do survive are much smaller. And so they, they go through some of what the West went through uh, only 200 years later. And with the big exception that Constantinople itself, the imperial court, the patriarchy are not as adversely affected uh, and they do survive as, imperial as an imperial center. Um. Well, professor, we have um, a question from uh, Rosario Yubash. Um, she said, Professor, do you think the natural factors uh, have an impact in Roman decline? For instance, the bad climate could have impact the warmer Mediterranean civilization. We were far off medieval warm periods, weren't we? Yes, so this is a, um, something that certainly people were looking at when I did the, uh, that video of the early Middle Ages course in 2000. Uh, 11, but uh, so climate science or applied to history, looking at climate for obvious reasons has become much, much more uh, uh, interesting and sophisticated. So yes, there certainly seem to be uh, climate fluctuations, abandonment of certain kinds of um, agriculture. Uh, improvement. Uh, so the medieval warm period means that uh, uh, many places in England are better suited to cultivation or even wine uh, grape growing. So yes, uh, <clears throat> my answer is the natural factors have a great impact, but I'm not up on them uh, because partly it's new. And again, I love to teach this course for reasons that I said in the video at the opening, uh, but it's not the area that I most keep up with since most of my publication has been on the central Middle Ages. Thank you, Professor. Um, and using this continuity, which Roman institutions survived and which of them didn't on the new so-called uh, Roman Empire? Yeah, well, the Senate doesn't survive, but Roman law uh, not so much survives, but it has a kind of an underground existence or transformation and then is revived in a big way in the 12th century. The, uh, the institutions that are already set up by the Catholic Church certainly survive, uh, but the <clears throat> the civilian government survives certainly as a memory and can be revived by people like Charlemagne, but it is the Constantinian Christian empire that is revived. So what happened to the literacy? What happened to the, the art, the, um, the, the capacity, uh, the, this creative uh, uh, um, inheritance that, that uh, the, the Greek and the, the Roman civilization had. What happened to this uh, all this creation, this create, create, creati create, creativity? Creativity. Creativity, thank you. Correct, yes. Well, 
again, it depends. For someone like Gibbon or, or many classics professors, the, the stuff that was written in the fifth, sixth, seventh century is worthless. It's a lot of it is saints' lives and, you know, uh, in, not to be compared to uh, Roman literature uh, in, in the classical age. Um, uh, on the other hand, these saints' lives are not, uh, they're different. They're extremely informative. Uh, there's a wonderful book that has just come out uh, that uh, wouldn't seem to have that much to do with uh, saints lives, but it is about pigs in the early Middle Ages by a historian named Jamie um, Kreiner, K-R-E-I-N-E-R. -E -E and her previous book was on hagiography. And in both cases, uh, she shows that these are sort of wonderful uh, stories, and they're not just fanciful elaborations of ridiculously credulous people. They're political documents, they're arguments, they're couched in a, um, a, a language that is not always easy to understand. But then again, uh, people reading uh, postmodernist literature in the future won't find it that easy to understand, uh, or even modernist uh, literature. Uh, won't find it that easy to understand. So, uh, but the quantity is less, and it is crucial that the laity tends not to be literate, that the leaders of society are warriors rather than, uh, um, you know, literate administrators. The literate administrators are mostly ecclesiastical. We know that Charlemagne sort of learned to read, but only sort of. And, you know, he's sort of as good as it gets uh, at that time. King Alfred is an exception. King Alfred even seems to have been involved in, if he didn't himself, translate uh, you know, Boethius and people like that. Uh, in, the, in the course, I said that the fact that you can see that Bede is probably the most learned person of the late seventh, early eighth century, or the, the early eighth century, uh, that Isidore of Seville is the most learned person of the seventh century, or that Boethius and Cassiodorus are the most learned people of the sixth century, is in itself a, not an encouraging sign. If the pool of extremely well-educated people, or the pool of people who have a library of more than 50 books is so tiny, then that's not a very good argument for average. Um, average. So, so the power was uh, uh, in the Middle Ages. The power was on, on the, the strength uh, instead of the of the knowledge, um, right? I mean, uh, the the power that uh, decided the the, the the new kingdoms, all this, because there was a revolution, a kind of I don't want to call it revolution, but it was the, the Europe was uh, with with the fall of the the Roman Empire. Uh, Europe itself was. Uh, forming new kingdoms and, uh, right. and new borders. So the power uh, was not on the, the literacy, the arts and, uh, and, and that uh, all those splendor, uh, right? But was on in the, the strength of the armies and th that could defend the, the, their own borders is that? Or even the strength of the local economy. Uh, yeah. uh, Kreiner and uh, uh, McCormick in a more sort of Mediterranean centered way argues that the, you know, if, if you were going to look at things that like uh, diet, nutrition, um, uh, resources that are controllable by people, uh, there, there is no decline in the standard of living. Uh, the, uh, the peasants or rustics of the ninth century seem to be living for the most part better than the um, slaves or colony of the Roman Empire of the fifth century. Yeah. Uh, but because we, I, you know, I assume all of us in this audience, uh, in this discussion, have placed tremendous value on things like books and libraries. The, uh, if you were walking around in the eighth century, the fact that people were able to fish without some lord telling them that they couldn't, or labor on their own land without paying a big tribute to some uh, local potentate would not comfort you for the fact that, uh, you know, you could barely find a copy of the Aeneid. Yeah, yes, of course.
Professor, we have um, a question from Matthias that says, could we argue, uh, argue I, that- Yeah, I see it. Oh, you can see, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, right, the, the barbarians definitely had a desire to see the Western empire rebuilt, although it, it depends on which ones. So the Vandals in North Africa uh, were very hostile to the empire and had no interest in seeing it uh, restored. Um, whereas uh, uh, the Ostrogoths, although they eventually were conquered by the empire or reconquered by Justinian, uh, looked to earlier models. <clears throat> and then you know, the Pope crowned Charlemagne as Roman Empire. Well, in that, yes, Roman Emperor and Charlemagne uh, are a recollection of the Roman Empire, but the involvement of the Pope is something different, right? No Roman Emperor had been crowned by the Pope. So this is an argument for both change and continuity. And in this case, I would say they're not, they're not contradictory. Uh, no, uh, the imagery of the Roman Empire never died. On the other hand, people used it in ways that it's older inhabitants or spokespersons would not have recognized. If you brought in somebody from Constantine's court to Charlemagne's court, first of all, he'd ask, where are we? What is Aachen? Where am I? Where's the olive oil? Where, where's the sun? Um, uh, uh, you know, where's the forum? Aachen was not built like a new Rome in the way that Constantinople was. Um, uh, you know, where, where are the senators? There are all sorts of things that are missing. Yes, uh, so nevertheless, it's not a fake. It's not out of touch with Rome. So the thing is that uh, it changed. We had they, they, the context changed, the, the, the society changed, everything changed. It, it could not, uh, we could not go back. Well, of course you can't have 300 years go by without change. Um, so viewed from one point of view, the conservatism and conservation is remarkable. The papacy um, is still writing letters on papyrus as late as the early 11th century. Uh, and papyrus is really hard to get. I mean, it has to come from Egypt. And uh, there's all this parchment out there that's much more convenient, but they're writing on papyrus because that's the way uh, that it had been done for centuries. So you have to hand it to them. Uh, there are only, I think, 24, 25 of them that survive uh, because it's a fragile material. Uh, we know the contents of others because they were copied onto parchment later. And this could be uh, taken as a sign of progress, right? The Romans wrote all this stuff on, on papyrus that, uh, that survives only like in the Egyptian desert and in some other odd places, whereas a lot of parchment has been lost, but not because it rotted away, uh, you know, it was thrown out or plundered or burned or simply misplaced or recycled, you know, for things like lampshades. But, um, you know, those uh, Carolingian Renaissance texts in places like Fulda or Reichenau or um, um, uh, Corby are in perfectly good shape. And in case of, uh, um, or more specifically in, to do with the Mediterranean trades, how did that help um, the, the, the theory of continuity in the Roman Empire? Uh, how does this trade help and who are the partners um, on these trades with, with the new uh, called Constantinople? This is the work of Michael McCormick in his book, The Origins of the European Economy. And he shows that um, the number of trade routes in the so-called Dark Ages is actually greater. This is partly because although the volume of trade is not so large as it had been at the height of the Roman Empire, it is less controlled. It is less in the hands of very large traders. It is more improvisational. And he also questions the term trade. If you are looking for merchants records or customs records or taxation records, they, they don't exist or they're, they're extremely rare. And so this has led 
scholars like Piren most famously to say that there was no trade, trade ended. If you look at things though, like um, gifts. So the papacy makes gifts of silk uh, uh, to various people and it gets the silk from Constantinople. Uh, uh, you can see that there's an awful lot of silk going around. It's not being bought and sold in markets, it's being given um, as um, gifts and tributes. Or if you look at relics, uh, to us relics are not trade because they're just little scraps of bone or you know, other body parts. But they're, they're, they're moving from east to west because the, most of the saints and certainly all of the apostles were active in the Eastern Mediterranean. And they come with little authentifying statements attached to them because of course, uh, uh, they're not stupid. They know that anybody could just kind of dig up some bones and claim that these were St. Mark or something like that. So you can get a very good idea of the traffic in these things, uh, much better than you can for traffic in what we would consider to be more normal or everyday uh, kinds of things. And, 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 and it's extremely active. And if we touch on the, um, on the topic of religion, uh, more specific Christianism. So when the Roman Empire fall, um, or, or there was a decline on the Roman Empire. Um, can we say that Christianism probably was one of the institutions that could adapt better? Because in a sense, it, it, it's probably expected that everything goes uh, uh, down as well. But in matter of fact, they adapt very well and they prosper and they, they, they grew more than ever, no? Yes, yes. Um... This is partly because they're a religious organization that commands a tremendous amount of loyalty, uh, including receiving donations. Uh, it is also because as St. Augustine laid out in a program, as it were, in the city of God, uh, it is an organization that it does not have to, does not depend on prosperity. Uh, that is, we see this very much here and you know to some extent all over the world restaurants for example which is an interest of mine depend on prosper a certain kind of prosperity and um so the fact that they are dying um is uh, obviously because of the contagiousness of the setting but it uh, you know it is something that turns out not to be adaptable to different conditions. Um, for better or worse, uh, internet companies are quite adaptable. Uh, entertainment companies, some of them are very adaptable because people have a lot of time on their hands and are streaming stuff like mad. Uh, on the other hand, actual movie theaters, in, in my country at least, are, um, are closing and their companies are uh, in great, uh, uh, great trouble. So this question of who is able to uh, adapt to shocks or the end of certain kinds of guarantees, we should not be unfamiliar with. Even even the the Christianity, I, I remember the, the even the monasteries monasteries they they um they started they used the trade right um, they 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 traded uh, some uh, some some products. Uh, uh, or they become the, themselves centers, yes, right? Yes, that's right. So mm -hmm. they, they adapt the also that that, that trade that Juan said about um, that became uh, that, that came after uh, after the Roman uh, Empire fall. Yeah. Uh, yes, right. Christianity. Yeah. Matthews have another question, Professor Friedman. Do you want me to read out? So. Oh yes. Yeah. So Matthew says, I've also heard- The presence of coinage, yes. Um, so sometimes the presence of coinage has been dismissed as simply treasure or hoarding and not of economic significance. So for example, uh, the largest amount of Arabic silver coins has been found in Scandinavia because of Viking raids. Uh, or tributes to the Vikings. 
but the Vikings don't seem to have used them. They, you know, they kind of hoarded them. Uh, similarly, the famous Sutton Hu burial, ship burial of a pagan king of um, uh, East Anglia in the seventh century. There are 30 gold coins from the Merovingian empire, all from a different mint. Well, you know, this looks like a coin collection or a treasure, but it's no more uh, an economically circulating a storehouse of money than the treasure accumulated by the dragon at the end of Beowulf. So um, the things like the uh, silver pennies, uh, uh, denarii issued by the Carolingians, these are coins that are, you know, have a value, but they're not, they're not uh, of a treasure type value. Uh, they seem to be more intended for actual trade and circulation. So uh, the amount of money in circulation is much less. You can go to coin shops and buy Roman coins uh, for uh, very little money. I mean, it depends on their condition and so forth, but uh, they're all over the place coins from the uh, second, third, fourth century. To get a coin from the Visigothic period uh, costs a fortune because most of them are gold and, and there are very few of them uh, in existence. Uh, and they're really, they're really not even a, uh, you know, everything is for sale, but they don't come on the market anymore because most of them are in museums. And looking at um, the Roman Empire, how it was, uh, probably probably not the, the biggest empire uh, that ever existed, and suddenly everything crumbles apart. However, uh, Constantinople um, still thrived and still managed to be strong and to keep going. Uh, how did that happen? How they managed that? Uh, when everything was crumbling apart, but they managed to stay strong and to, to, to build themselves for a long period of time. I think an argument could be made that it is a strategic location that's unmatched in the Western world. It controls the access between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, and also the land access from Europe to Asia. There's no other way except to go north of the Black Sea, uh, you know, in a, uh, an extreme detour uh, to get uh, an essentially land or nearly all land route to, to Asia. Uh, it also was unconquerable for a long time. It withstood an incredible number of sieges, including the simultaneous Arab and Avar siege of uh, 7, 714, 717 rather. It uh, fell to the Crusaders in 1204 twice. Uh, of course, it fell to the uh, Ottomans in 1453. But um, some of that then is that <clears throat> very much unlike Rome, uh, it is a city that is both economically and militarily uh, vital, defensible, and central. Yeah, and it was vital for the Silk, uh, silk Road, uh, the, the Silk Road, right? For the, I'm sorry, say that again. I, I, I said, uh, I asked if uh, it was vital for the Silk Road. The... Uh, yes, yes. Although, um, you know, the Silk Road changes its destination at various times. Sometimes it's um, on the Black Sea, places like Trabzon. Uh, sometimes it's in, uh, you know, um, the Eastern Mediterranean, like um, Accra or Tyre. Yes. Um, we have another question, Professor, from Telma Mourin. Yes, uh, in the accuracy of the Roman legal system. Uh, yes, accuracy, um, comprehensiveness, uh, uh, great concern with procedure, with jurisprudence. You know, how do you or organize decision making, um, distinctions, property. Uh, so yes, it's um, 
it's it's accuracy or exactness but it's also the sheer coverage that it has of so many uh, different things. The fact that it is the basis of Portuguese and other European law, uh, uh, of course, is due to this. It is not the basis of the legal systems of England and the United States, which are based on common law uh, and are give more power to precedent and to juries than to judges and legislation. But nevertheless, in fact, despite their saying that they're not based on Roman law. They're very much based on Roman law. Well, even inside the Roman Empire, and even before it, 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 uh, it fell, uh, even inside the Roman Empire, was there a, a distinction between the, the south and the north of, of the, the, the empire? I mean, um, the mid, because the, 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 what I try to say is that uh, we see that uh, the north is a little bit more, um, um, not so. It, 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 it's not so adaptable to the, the 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 normal structures. I mean, it's not so. It seems always the, the history seems to 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 tell us seems. I mean, I'm saying seems to tell us that the 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 southern uh, the South Europe is more obeying to the the, the system. The the North is a little bit more uh, rebellious, uh, rebel. That's um, right. That's right. Was it uh, happening uh, also in the Roman Empire while it was uh, um, still a Roman Empire? I think the big contradiction in the Roman Empire or contrast is not so much north-south as Mediterranean, non-Mediterranean. The further you get away from the Mediterranean, the less Roman it is in terms of climate. Uh, you know, once you get north of the zone where olive trees will grow, or where wine grapes uh, will grow, uh, you're kind of in, yes, the Romans colonize as far up as Scotland, but they don't really like it. It's not really very Roman. And so, you know, you can see this in Provence, in Southern France, uh, there are Roman ruins all over the place. In Brittany and Normandy, uh, uh, they're not, even though they were part of the empire, the centers of population were in the Mediterranean areas. And you have an even more dramatic contrast uh, in uh, Africa. So the coastal areas are very heavily settled and very heavily cultivated. Uh, and of course, once you get to the desert, it's, uh, it's not very Roman at all. The, um, the paradox there is that now in Europe, the contrast is between the northern side of the Mediterranean and the southern side. Whereas in the Roman Empire, um, what's now Tunisia and uh, uh, what's now Italy would be much more similar than different. Uh, Algeria and uh, uh, Spain, uh, Morocco and Spain, uh, uh, Morocco and Lusitania would be uh, you know, quite recognizable. Uh, the same olive trees, the same wine grapes, uh, you know, the same weather patterns uh, uh, until you get into the desert. Uh, but um, uh, now, obviously, uh, not only because of religious difference, but uh, poverty as well. The, the, uh, Europe at its poorest is more prosperous looking than uh, most of North Africa. Yeah. We, have another, we have another question of uh, uh, Jeffrey Barzell. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, Islam being an inheritor of the Roman Empire. Right, so some of this is um, uh, things like the uh, translations of uh, Greek medicine or of Aristotle uh, into Arabic uh, and the uh, intelligentsia of the uh, Islamic world um, not only accepting uh, many aspects of the classical Greco-Roman world, but preserving it. Um, most of the, uh, uh, a tremendous amount of classical medicine and science are known to us through Latin translations of uh, Arab manuscripts, Arab texts. The, um, the nature of the Islamic city eventually is different, uh, but the, um, 
uh, Islamic conquerors preserve uh, Roman cities uh, like Alexandria or um, uh, Damascus when they have conquered them. The uh, religious difference is obvious, but on the other hand, uh, you would have to say that already the Roman Empire had embraced two very different religious traditions, that of you know what's called paganism and that of Christianity. Um, so it's really a corrective, this statement, a corrective to the belief not only of a clash of civilizations between you know Islam and the West, but of the notion in Piren that the um, Islamic conquest destroyed trade in the Mediterranean. And while certainly the Mediterranean is transformed and Northern Europe emerges as much more important than it had been in the Roman Empire and in the modern world, um, you know, more prosperous or more urban or more industrial than Southern Europe, um, I wouldn't attribute that all the way back to the era of Islamic conquest. And was it uh, essential for the Renaissance, uh, this uh, preservation, the, this uh, Islamic uh, preservation of the, the, the classics um, for the tra transition between the, the, the Middle Ages and the, the modern ages? Yes, well, um, eventually many of the Greek originals uh, are found in Constantinople. So, uh, you know, the Renaissance uh, uh, scholars in Italy uh, become familiar with Plato uh, in a way that the Middle Ages was not, but the Middle Ages was familiar with almost all of the corpus of Aristotle that still survives uh, by 1300. And, and that knowledge came not from Constantinople, but from, you know, translations of Arab uh, translations. So the um, Islamic scholars were interested in some things and not others. They're not interested in the plays. So they're not translating Sophocles or Euripides uh, into Arabic. They're interested in medicine very much. Uh, they're interested in science. They're interested in mathematics. They're interested in philosophy. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so uh, there are certain texts that are, are received in the Latin world via uh, the Arabic uh, and Islamic world. And there is for a while a kind of, you know, for example, there, there is an Aristotelian Islamic form in the works of people like Al-Farabi or uh, Averroes or Avicenna. Uh, and there are Christian Aristotelians like Aquinas uh, and uh, Jewish Aristotelians, or you know, people who apply uh, logic to theology like Maimonides. Yes, Professor. Mahmoud. I mean, I don't want to over romanticize this as if you know Maimonides of Arroways and Aquinas um, got together and you know formed a club or had yes. <laughs> had uh, dinners uh, together. But uh, there is some reality to the notion of intellectual exchange. Uh, Professor Matthews uh, has put another question. Yes. So um, I would say this is always an interesting question of why peoples embrace kind of world religions. Uh, it's often because their gods no longer seem to explain everything. Once you come into contact with a larger world, then your gods seem rather small. And um, the temptation to latch on to a uh, religion of greater popularity, but also explainability, this is um, the phenomenon that's taken place all over the world as uh, you know, traditional uh, religions, localized religions have succumbed usually to Christianity or to Islam. The... Um, uh, the barbarians, of course, embraced a certain kind of Christianity to become Roman, but then kept themselves distinct by having Arian Christianity in defiance of the common Roman opinion that had rejected. So you have a period from the late fourth to um, 
uh, the really the eighth century, I guess the Lombards remained Aryans uh, to the end in which uh, different so-called barbarian peoples embrace different kinds of Christianity. Uh, and people like the uh, English and the Franks don't have an Aryan period. That is, they go from their old religion to Catholic Christianity, uh, but other areas, uh, Portugal uh, uh, among them, uh, experience a kind of an Aryan uh, interlude. Thank you. Although I think Portugal less than Spain. Um, Professor Friedman, we don't want to take a lot of your time. So if someone have any questions now will be the time for that. Well, um, please get in touch with me if anything comes up and afterwards I'm at paul.friedman at yale.edu uh, okay. and easy to find through the Yale History Department website. Thank it's you. been uh, It's been a lot of fun. Your questions are very suggestive and I'm glad that I had uh, at least plausible sounding answers to all of them. You don't have to be satisfied <laughs> with the answers though. Uh, let me hasten to add. Just one last question, if, if Paul or Professor Friedman allows me. Um, sure. What was the influence that the Roman Empire had uh, on the Middle Ages? A, a lot of it is um, indirect through the church uh, for the reasons I mentioned before, the papal office, uh, uh, its uh, influence uh, in, on the state, uh, the notion of centralization as opposed to feudalism, uh, the architecture, right? The Romanesque style is so called for a reason. Um, and in, I don't, in some languages, it's not, in, in English, it's called Romanesque and in French, it's called Romanesque, but in many um, uh, European languages, it's just Roman, is it not? So, um, uh, but I, if I had to say the most important perhaps is law for the reasons that uh, uh, you mentioned. It continues to inform the legal systems of the um, civil law countries as they're called. Uh, it um, created modern notions of political reality more than theoretical documents like Plato's Republic or Aristotle's politics. Uh, and uh, is perhaps the most enduring legacy of the, of the Roman period. Thank you. And I have to highlight that Matthew says that the, your answers were indeed satisfying. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I, I hope so. And we have thank you all. It's been really a, a great pleasure. And thank you, Jean, for uh, organizing this and for, to Jenny and Sandra for uh, setting up this uh, association. I wish you all the best, and I'm I'm honored to be honor. uh, the first of your interlocutors. It was an honor for us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.